Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to Bridge and Seminary. I'm going to turn everything over to the Dean of ASCOM, Dr. Lori Kemper. Thank you. So I'm hoping I have this high enough so that you can hear me. If you cannot hear me in the back, please raise your hand. Okay, so you must either have heard me or not. Um, I want to welcome you. We are uh, doing this to help our students become ready for that transition from being in classes to being out and learning on your own and learning with patients. Um, the, the, the things that you're going to hear today are going to have a couple of speakers and we are then going to have a few awards and then we'll have a little gift for the students. So um, please at the end bear with me so that I can get you easily over to the sides to get the gift without bunching up. So. I want to first of all introduce Dr. Sean Reeder. Dr. Reeder is our Associate Dean of Clinical Education. He is an Associate Professor and he is a family physician who practices here at Midwestern University. So Dr. Reeder. There we are. I usually prefer the, the Garth Brooks one, but uh, we'll do this for today. So I'm Dr. Sean Reeder, and I'm the Associate Dean for Clinical Education, which means I am responsible for all of you in your third and fourth year, and we will get to know each other very well. Uh, as Dr. Kemper and Dr. Knight have noted, this is the bridging ceremony, and this is really the acknowledgement uh, of the accomplishment of U.S. students and also to, to um, acknowledge the transition from your preclinical classroom learning to clinical rotation. Well, I'm sure that you're all excited to get into the hospitals and the clinics. Uh, realize that each of you will need to challenge yourselves to step up and step out of your, your comfort zone. This is going to be a style of learning which most of you have probably never experienced. If you think about it from, very, from your very first years of education back in preschool, uh, everything was given directly to you. Uh, in, in each class, the lecturer or the teacher provided direction, detailed specific learning exercises for you to complete. Even here at Midwestern University, um, each day you come to class, and you find your faculty member eagerly awaiting your arrival to present a, a rehearsed lecture on a specific medical topics, most likely at the next course exam or on your Comlex, and Dolby surround sound in exactly 50 minutes or less. And don't worry if you were too tired or you just couldn't find your way to campus, the lecture is probably recorded, and you can watch it from the comfort of your own couch at your convenience at two times speed. <laughs> but rotations are different. The experience is happening right now, <clears throat> live, in person. And if you weren't there, then you missed it because there's no pause or rewind button. My guess is that this is going to be a new and different environment of learning. And some of you might be just a little bit anxious. Because if you're in this room, you have a long history of more often than not being correct and doing it right the first time. But now we're asking you to do something completely different in an unfamiliar environment. And that will take some risk. And you might be, uh, occasionally you might be wrong or not get it right on the first try. Please remember that failure to try for fear of failure is not going to be an option. So back when I was, when I was younger, one of the prime time shows, and this is really dating myself, one of the primetime shows was the Carol Burnett and Friends show. And uh, some of the parents may have, uh, none of you in this first four rows, <laughs> have ever seen that. 
it was a compilation of a bunch of silly skits and, and musicals. And one of the, the, the characters on that show was Tim Conway. And Tim Conway was always a pretty funny guy, kind of a comedian type. And I remember this one skit where Tim Conway was, he was a doctor, and he had this big syringe full of lidocaine. And whatever the skit was, he was supposed to inject the, the patient with this lidocaine. But every time he went to inject, somebody would bump him or he would trip and he you know, injected his arm and then he injected his leg and then the other leg and then miraculously toward the end of the skit, he actually injects the same side arm. So at the end of the skit, he's completely laying on the floor anesthetized. And that's a little bit how I remember my clinical training. Lots of mistakes. <laughs> So as a physician, you know, we all have war stories. We sit around the doctor's lounge, you know, remember that thing, and you know, talk about their worst cases and things like that. If you ask Dr. Kemper or Dr. Nichols about their war stories, they'd probably tell you about the time that they saw something that no one else saw. They challenged the system to get the care that their patient needed and ultimately saved the patient's life. My war stories are a little bit more like Tim Conway. 101 really dumb things not to do as a medical student. <laughs> so I'm doing a physical on this elderly gentleman on one of my rotations, and I and get to the point in the physical where you're supposed to test the deep tendon reflexes. And uh, so I'm going to tap the patellar tendon to test his lower extremity DTRs. And he's sitting on the bed, and so I'm kind of standing in front of him, squatted down just a little bit <laughs> like there. And I'm thinking, we probably shouldn't be standing right in front of him with his legs straddling me. But my second thought was, well, he's pretty elderly. I think it'll be okay. But it wasn't, and he laid into me good. So the learning opportunity here is, if you're going to test reflexes, don't stand directly in front of the patient, even if they're elderly. I was rounding with my attending physician at Stormontville Hospital in Topeka, Kansas, and we entered the patient's room to see how he was doing, and we find him just finishing up the last of his breakfast, and I remember it vividly, scrambled eggs, bacon toast, and orange juice. And while we were talking to him, he started to choke just a little bit on the last few bites of his meal. Wanting to be involved, I stepped to the bedside, there's a little towel there, I take the towel and I make a little bowl with my hands and I offer for him to spit the, the last of his meal into my bowl. So he proceeds to produce, or maybe reproduce, the full portion of scrambled eggs, bacon toast, orange juice, most of the previous night's dinner and I think some of the previous day's lunch. My little bowl was not big enough. <laughs> Sheepishly, I look over to my attending, pleading for help. What do I do? He just walks away, <laughs> calls the nurse to come in and, and help me out. This experience was not a success, but it was involved. And I learned that if I ever offer to have a patient spit up into my hands again, I'll bring a bigger towel. <laughs> Tucson, Arizona, Family Medicine Clinic with Dr. Nicholas Pazzi. Dr. Pazzi and I were going to burn this molar skin tag off the patient's back. And the patient's laying face down on the table. We had already prepped the site. We had numbed it and, and cleaned it with alcohol. And Dr. Pazzi hands me the electrocautery and he gives me the nod. The nod that says, it's your turn. You're in. Make me proud, kid. So now I, I, I take the cautery, but... You know, Dr. Pazzi's cautery device was like 100 years old, and it wasn't grounded, so if you actually touched the patient when it was activated, it would shock and cauterize you at the same time as the patient. And it wasn't like a, a typical cautery that the tip got warm. It actually had like this one-inch electric arc that shot off the tip of it, kind of like the proton beam in the Ghostbusters movie. So I'm, I'm burning and zapping, and you know, of course this takes me a long time because I'm a student, and at some point it starts to bleed. So I reach over the mayo stand and I grab the cotton ball and I dab the, the blood and then zap it again. But what I had grabbed was the cotton ball that was loaded with alcohol that we had used to, to uh, clean the site. And when I zapped it, this 
blue flame engulfed my, my entire head and my face and it singed my eyelashes and burned my eyebrows. Just a little bit of information. I still have to trim them very closely because some of them come in a little bit crooked. I look up at Dr. Paz. He's still sizzling and smoking to find him holding back a laugh as hard as he can so the patient doesn't know what I did. So apparently he thought that was pretty funny. The learning opportunity to remove any flammable materials before using a 100-year-old Ghostbusters electrocautery device unless you prefer not to have facial hair. I make a point of these silly stories to show that in, in, in rotations in this transition time, you aren't expected to be perfect. Mistakes will happen, and if you're willing to step out of your comfort zone and be involved, you aren't always going to do it right the first time, but that's really the only way to learn. Failure to try for fear of feeling Fear, failure to try for fear of failing is not an option if you're going to do what is needed to become a physician. Make a point to challenge yourself and be involved. Thank you. If you could give me that. So Dr. Scott was going to speak for us today, but she had a family emergency and had to leave this morning. So unfortunately, you're going to get the bullet points that I put together over an hour this morning. Um, but I'd like to, first of all, introduce some of the clinical chairs, because as you move forward, you might need to get in touch with them, and it'd be nice to know that it's somebody that you've seen before. So I'd like to first introduce Dr. Agahi. Dr. Agahi is the chair of Women and, and Child Health Care. And um, Dr. Sands is the vice chair of osteopathic family and community medicine. Dr. Middleton is the chair, but her daughter's getting married tomorrow. So she kind of chose that over this. I <laughs> don't know why. Dr. Peppo is the chair of internal medicine. And Dr. Finch is the chair of integrated medicine and also the, the interim chair of surgery. So thank you all for coming. You'll meet some of the chairs in, in um, the basic sciences in a few minutes, but I want to give you the bullet points. So here are some of the things I thought about, and I've been a student, a preceptor, and now the dean. So uh, I think I've experienced some of these either as a student messing up. And, and don't, don't think Dr. Reeder's the only one who's messed up. Um, one of the things I also found is that you need to look at gloves before you put them on <laughs> and make sure that they're not torn when you do any kind of internal exams. Um, so... Number one, be on time. And being on time means being early. And sometimes really early. When you're on surgery, as an example, or when you're on internal medicine, you may be asked to pre-round. And pre-rounding doesn't take like a minute. It takes however long it takes to look at the chart, to track down lab, to meet with the patient. Maybe some of the patient's family are in there and then be prepared to give a concise report of what you found. Two, don't leave early. Preceptors may ask you if you want to leave early, but they may be just testing you for dedication. So be careful about that. Now, sometimes I would have students leave early because the last student was that, or the last patient was that patient that was going to be there for an hour, and wouldn't let a student in there. So there's no reason for the student to stay. But you need to read the, the situation. Three, show initiative. You should have increasing responsibility. And increasing res responsibility requires you to show the preceptor that you won't overstep your training 
or do procedures without supervision. And remember that that preceptor's license is on the line for whatever you do. So you want to make sure that you get that increasing responsibility based on demonstrating capability. Four, prepare for the day. Read about what you just saw and also make sure that you know what's on the surgical list for tomorrow and read about that because the surgeon may likely say to you, so what is the blood supply of the gallbladder? And where is it located? And what nerves are in this area? And on and on and on. So be prepared for that. Five, be kind to everyone. It doesn't matter if that person is a patient, a peer, the, the maintenance person, the IT guy. You want to treat everybody respectfully and kind. Six, do not ask questions that imply that you don't agree with the preceptor in front of the patient. We get complaints about this every year. Seven, do not disagree with the preceptor in front of patients or staff. Rather, ask questions. So if you have a question, you can ask it, but don't do it while the, while the preceptor is talking to the patient about what they're planning to do. And it's best not to say something like, but won't echinacea work better than that antibiotic for strep? So be careful about the kinds of questions you ask. As I said, eight is be respectful to everyone. Nine, don't take it personally if a patient says they don't want the student in the room. They may be entirely embarrassed about why they're there, or they may have had a bad experience in the past that they only trust the doctor that is sitting right in front of them. So please, don't take it personally. Just step away. Don't argue with the patient. Don't argue with the preceptor. Ten, remember the nursing staff may know more than you. Even today, I find that the nursing staff might know more than me. So keep that in mind. And that goes back to number eight, be respectful to everyone. Eleven, use humor appropriately. You heard that Dr. Reeder's preceptor did not burst into laughter when the ARC came back and took off his eyebrows. So it's knowing when to laugh and when to say something that is humorous and when it could be hurtful. Don't make fun of the preceptor. Don't make fun of the patients. But there are some things that could happen. As, as an example, I remember working with a pulmonologist and he had been telling this patient again and again, you've got to quit smoking. It's bad for your lungs. And no response, no response, no response. Then one day she comes in and she says to him, I quit smoking. And he said, really? What did you do to quit smoking? She said, I took up knitting. I didn't want to ruin my work that I'd been doing. So in, in talking to him later, I said, well, you could start your own knitting slash pulmonology office, and then train people to quit smoking by teaching them how to knit. Um, Twelve, be mindful of the preceptor's time. Don't ask a question just as they're running out the door to see their son's baseball game. Be aware of what's going on around you at the time. Thirteen, ask for specific input mid-rotation. And specific input is not, how am I doing? What do you think the answer to that is? Okay. You're doing okay. And then you say later, I don't understand why I failed the rotation. He said I was doing okay. So here's, an, here's a question that you could ask. Would you have asked different questions than I did? Would you have done the examination in a different manner? That helps to know specifically how you did. 14, and believe me, we're only halfway through. <laughs> ask, for ask for letters of recommendation the third week of the rotation. And ask it this way, not would you write me a letter, but 
Would you feel that you know me well enough to provide a supportive letter of recommendation for my heiress application? By doing it that way, you're giving them an out because then they could say, I don't feel like I know you well enough. When in fact, what they're thinking is, I know you too well to write the letter, but they're not saying that to you. So they have a way of saving face and getting out of it. If they ask you to write the letter, and then they'll sign it, just thank them and tell them that we discourage that, that the school discourages it. 15, don't try to show up residents, but answer correctly when asked and volunteer when no one else does. So you don't want to jump in ahead of the resident and try to show you know more. But if they don't know, answer and answer it correctly. It's not a spitting contest. You don't want to try to make the residents feel bad because they may be interviewing you the next year. 16, treat every rotation like that is the specialty you will enter. There's nothing that is beneath you to learn. There's nothing irrelevant to your learning. Every nugget counts. So maybe you don't like psychiatry, you want to be a surgeon, but I'm telling you, every single patient you come in contact with, everybody in the OR who's working with you actually has a mind. So it's helpful to know psychiatry. 17, if you have a reason that you may need to be accommodated, such as diabetes or you faint if you haven't eaten for a certain num number of hours, make sure the preceptor knows that because they'll help you to make sure that you take care of your own health as well. 18, ask for comments on your evaluation that show a strength that they have witnessed, especially if you can ask right after they tell you that you did something great. It'll make it into your MSPE. 19, demonstrate how you meet a certain competency by asking the preceptor for guidance. For instance, I'm trying to understand systems-based practice. How would you like me to show you that I understand? What that does is it helps them to look at systems-based practice, which commonly preceptors don't know how to, how to score, and then they'll give you some recommendations as to how to meet the requirement, and by doing that, they also recognize what it is. 20, dress professionally with a clean and pressed white jacket, which all of you look like you have on today, but I remember being in, having students come to my office where I'm thinking, must have had a hamburger at lunch, and he likes both mustard and ketchup. So you want to avoid that. And, and the other thing is, if you see the doctor wearing scrubs, Ask if that's what they want you to wear before you wear it, okay? 21, call the week before you start to be sure where you are to be and when. Don't do it Friday afternoon after you've taken your post-rotation exam. Some doctors take off Friday afternoon, so you'll never know when you were supposed to be there Monday. So Thursday, most doctors work. Wednesday, plus minus. Um, 22, we're really getting toward the end. Use appropriate medical language for any written documentation you're asked to provide. If the patient uses lay language, you can put it in quotes, but it would be best not to say the person had really loose poop. Diarrhea would be a better use of, of a term. 23, never take photographs of patients or medical records. Never. We've had a student in the past take a photograph and then something in her phone automatically loaded it to some social media site. Don't do that. Just don't have it in your phone. 24, never carry records or patient information out of the facility. 25, never speak about a patient to a peer, especially in a public place. And guess what places are public? 
the hospital cafeteria, the elevator, the bathroom. Don't talk about patients anywhere but when it's appropriate and in an appropriate location. 26, never contact a preceptor after they have assessed your performance to get a better grade or comment. That one, I think all of the chairs have enjoyed the conversation with the, with the student. 27, if you don't know an answer, admit it. Don't make something up. Say, I will have the answer tomorrow, and then have it. And then don't use that excuse too often. That means that it goes back to number three or four. You prepare for what's happening the next day. And 28, and the last one, come to the rotation wanting to learn. If you want to learn and you show gratitude for what people, patients, preceptors, nursing staff teach you, you will do well, even when you don't know the answer every time when you're first asked. So with that, Thank you. I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker. Dr. Nichols is somebody that I met in medical school. She and I were rotating at the same location, so you're going to make no new friends, believe it or not. Uh, she and I have been friends since probably 1980, and Dr. Nichols was the past dean of our sister college, CCOM and she is an internist by training. And she actually is the author of a book that you're going to receive as a gift today. So without further ado, Dr. Nichols. Thank you. I, uh Let's give a round of applause for those presentations. They were so good. <laughs> so I'm very honored to be here. Uh, as Dr. Kemper said, I was the dean of CCOM for 16 years. And I was actually the first chair of internal medicine here at ASCOM, probably before you were born. And um, now you have Dr. Peppo, who was one, who was one of my role models. So uh, you're, in, you're in very good hands. So uh, as uh, Dr. Kemper said, um, I am an internist and was doing that at a time when women were not uh, very common in medicine. As Dr. Kemper said, we graduated the same year, but not in the same school. Uh, so that provided a lot of uh, interesting opportunities. So it just so happened, because of that, I was the first woman to be president of the State Association here of the American College of Osteopathic Internists and the American Osteopathic Association. Great honors. So and was one of the first two DOs to be nominated to the ACGME board that runs the accreditation for all the 160,000 residency positions in the United States, and was honored to be elected the chair. So I've taught a lot of leadership talks, and my best advice is that I have made every leadership mistake in the book, and it's in the, this book. So you will get a copy and a chance. Um, if you got a few minutes, I'll sign up for you. So when I was dean, I was in my office in the dean suite, and one of the staff came running in, and she said, Dr. So-and-so is on the phone, and he is really mad. And this was one of our surgeons. So I picked up the phone, and I said, Dr. So-and-so, what, what could I do to help you? And he said, find Dr. Chad. And I'm thinking, I don't know a Dr. Chad, but he's really mad. I probably, you know, so what do I do? So I say, well, um, who is Dr. Chad? He said, how do I know? He's one of your medical students. Oh, okay. 
So he said, I'm ready to take this patient to surgery, and she will not agree to sign the consent and go to surgery until Dr. Chad comes and tells her that it's okay. <laughs> so I sent my staff. They found him. He found the patient. He, she got her to agree, and off, off they went. So... I thought, there's got to be a little more to this story. So I had my staff set up an appointment with him. And uh, next day, said, so, so was, is this a, a relative of yours that they wanted your approval? She said, no. I said, well, is it somebody that you knew before she was in the hospital? And he said, no. I said, so she did not know you until you had met her as a medical student in the hospital, and she would not go to surgery without your approval. You are a third-year medical student. This is a, a well-renowned surgeon, and she, you would, she wouldn't do what he said until she talked to you. Have you got any idea why? And he said, well, maybe it had to do with the dog. I will tell you the rest of that story in a few more minutes. OK, so congratulations. So as physicians, when you get into your practice, you are a true leader. You are leading your patients every single day. They are paying attention to you, unless you were uh, that surgeon, but they, they were paying attention to what you say every day. And what we want to discuss with you is that you can become a leader, not just to the patients, but of other physicians. and and. The question is, why would you want to do that? Well, who else knows more about medicine than doctors? We need to have doctors involved in all levels of hospitals and health systems and legislation and organizations to do the right thing. So. So how do you become a good leader? Well, prepare. Prepare. And learn some leadership principles. So I'm going to just hit on a couple of things. So you've all flown on an airplane, and they always say, put your mask on first before you help others. So in pre-COVID days, that was, that's where we thought it ended. So, but the, still the same thing applies, that you need the concept of putting your own mask on and being sure that you are healthy and rested and prepared, then you can help others. And, you, and following Dr. Kemper's uh, advice, uh, this is something that you will start doing on rotations uh, that you need to pay attention to. Be sure that you are in a good place. And, and if that's a challenge, talk to your faculty. And be, be sure you are prepared. OK. And the way I recommend that is the three, the three Fs of faith, fitness, and family. Now, faith means different things to different people. It may be a religious faith, or it may be your belief in what is important in your life. And believe me, having been in private practice in Mesa for 17 years before I went to Chicago to be dean, I know the kind of hours that you have to work and the kind of challenges that you have. And you, the people who can't deal with that have lost their grounding. 
So whatever the faith is, whatever your definition of that, that keeps you grounded on what is important. And then fam being fit goes without saying, and family. So this is not the best kind of three-legged stool. This one. This one is. You need all of them. You need all of those pieces together to make, to make, it, to make it work. OK. So how do, how do I become a good leader? I talked about preparing yourself. Now leadership principles. So it starts with you. You are moving into a profession that expects you to be responsible for what you do. So your leadership starts with you, but it's not about you. That, if you can learn that lesson earlier than I did, you'll be way ahead. Because I, I love to tell people what to do. Ask my three younger sisters. And, and I had to come to the understanding that leadership is an honor that people give me. And so it's not about me. It's about on those people honoring them back to lead them in, in the direction. And it, so it's not about getting my way. I'm guiding them. I'm helping them. I'm not the one. If, you, if you're way out, if you're leading a group and you're way out in front of them, you're not leading, you're just going for a walk. So it's not about getting your way. So I like this quote, and the colors went nicely with my, with my background, from uh, Lao Tzu, the way to do is to be. So, so you need to align your, your faith, your belief with who you are and keep that alignment at all times. So lead yourself, and you're smart. You know how many people wanted to sit in the seats that you're in? A whole heck of a lot. So you're smart, you've worked hard, you're supposed to be here, and you are continuing to work hard. But more than that, you need to strive to be wise. And that's taking the knowledge, and Dr. Kemper talked about this, of putting it in, in perspective and being aware of where you are, of who the other people are, what their concerns are, reading the body language of other individuals. She talked about that with your preceptor when he says, uh, so, do you want to go home early? Uh, oh, no, 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 I'm really happy to stay here. I'm, I'm really committed, you know. You've got to read the body language. You've got to read what's, go, what's going on. Strive to be wise. And every individual I know that is in a leadership role is still working on that one. Okay, so the B's of leadership. Be the change you want to see. You can't tell other people. I, my favorite family physician when I was an in, internist in Mesa was this the guy that always was talking to his patients about the importance of exercise and losing weight. He had to have been at least 350 pounds. He was not convincing because he wasn't doing that. Uh, he wasn't internalizing that himself. Be professional. There's never, uh, as Dr. Kemper said, using the right medical words. Uh, yes, if you're going to quote, you do need to quote the patient, 
but in quotations and then function in a professional manner. Be authentic. Um, if you don't know, it's really important to say that, uh, but then you better know the next day. Be accountable, similar, similar kind of thing. You, those patients are depending on you and your attendings are depending on you. If you say, I'm gonna, I'll check the lab uh, in an hour from now and I'll call you if there's any change when you're on your way to the, your kid's baseball game. And you better do it. And be respectful. I think that point's been made. Now, have you noticed there's one word in there that's capitalized after the word be, and that's professional. I did that on purpose because the, you're learning to do that. That's part of your development process, and there are times when you're going to mess that up and use those as learning opportunities. Okay, and be humble. Um, what is that old West, country western song? It's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Okay, but um, anyway. Um, it's be, be humble. Okay, so I love this quote from the Dalai Lama. When you talk, you're only repeating what you already know. But when you listen, you might learn something new. And there's another way to put that. You don't get smarter by talking. So right now, I'm not getting smarter, but I certainly hope you are. So, so his point is, listen, listen, listen. We tend to listen to and think, well, I hope you'll hur he'll hurry up and get done talking what he's, what, what he's saying because I've got something really wonderful to say. Um, probably not helpful. Listen to understand to show that you're interested in that, in that person, to show concern and back to that learning thing. So how do I become a good leader? Well, collegiality. We're all in this together. This is, we're working for better patient care. And empathy, sympathy means, I'm so sorry that you're having that problem. Empathy means, boy, I had that too, and it, I really understand what it feels like. Empathy, even, even if you haven't had that. Boy, this looks like something you're really having a lot of trouble dealing with. And I've had similar experiences, and maybe we can talk, talk through it. Um, empower people, uh, your, your classmates, sometimes your patients. And as a leader, what is the purpose of the team? And that gets back to, it's not about me. It's about the team and what the team is going to achieve. And I, this is another quote from Lao Tzu. And there I put, he was around a really long time ago. When the work is done, the aim achieved, they will say, we did it ourselves. That's really the ideal leader. I haven't, I'm not there yet. I still like to be known as the leader. But it's, our, it's a goal. It's a goal. So this is a quote from my grandfather who never went to college. He was um, graduated from high school and then went to Valparaiso now University outside of Chicago for the summer and took a, got a teaching certificate and he went back uh, at the in, 
in the fall and was the teacher in a one-room school, and 10 of the 20 students were his younger brothers and sisters. And that didn't turn out to be his life goal, but he was, he was in, in the Indiana State Legislature, and he was always in some kind of a leadership role as a gentleman farmer, which meant he didn't have cows. So uh, that got you a lot dirtier. But um, one person can make a difference. And then he said, and one person must make a difference. You are responsible for that. So I love this quote, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. So our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. So, back to Dr. Chad. So he said, when I asked him, why do you think this woman wanted to talk to you when, as a third year medical student, which you're all going to be in a matter of weeks and uh, months, instead of doing what this well-regarded surgeon said. And he said, as I told you, he said, well, maybe it was the dog. And I said, okay, you're going to have to explain this a little bit more. And he said, remember what you told us? And I'm going, oh, dear. Uh, you never know exactly how that's going to go. But he said... You told us that the patients don't care what you know until they know that you care. So as a medical student, I had a little bit more time to talk to her and get acquainted with her and found out that she lived alone. Her husband was gone. Her, her, she did, was not close to any family members but she had a dog, and that dog was the light of her life, and the dog's name was Tigger. So every time I would go check on her, which was a couple times a day, because he had a little bit more time, I'd ask about Tigger, and what was Tigger's favorite food, and what was, what was Tigger's favorite toy, and, and the person taking care of Tigger right now, how is Tigger doing, he said. We just talked about her dog because that was a way that I was showing her that I cared about her as a human being. So that's my final quote to you. Your patients don't care what you know till they know that you care. Don't forget to find out the dog's name. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nichols. So one of the things that we always do at the bridging ceremony is to think back about what the last two years have held. And um, we do that through giving some awards for people who were ex did exceptional work in a number of different areas. So I would like to first of all introduce Dr. Inouye, who is the Associate Dean for the College of Graduate Studies, and she will introduce the basic science courses and their directors and chairs, and she'll, they'll give those awards. Dr. Inouye. Thank you, Dr. Kemper. First of all, I wanted to say uh, hello. Most of you don't know who I am. I am a recent transplant from the Danners Grove uh, campus where I had the privilege of working with Dr. Nichols 
while she was the dean of CCOM. And now I had the continued privilege to work with Dr. Kemper on the Glendale campus, so it's very nice to be here. Um, the College of Graduate Studies Dean's Office would like to offer our congratulations to the Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine class of 2025. For the past two years, you have survived a rigorous medical curriculum that has challenged your ability to balance learning, being flexible, managing your time efficiently, caring for yourself and your loved ones, and being resilient. These skills that you have learned will serve you well in your practice in any area of medicine. The basic science faculty in the College of Graduate Studies witness the dedication, hard work, determination, and sacrifices that you've made the past two years in order to excel in your academics and bring you to this point in your medical ed education to this celebration today. So congratulations. We commend and congratulate you on this accomplishment and we wish you all the very best as you progress to your exciting and challenging medical training and clinical rotations. On behalf of the faculty and staff in the College of Graduate Studies, it has been an honor to be a part of your medical education and we are proud of each of your accomplishments. We will now present an award from each basic science department followed by an award from the College of Graduate Studies Dean's Office. The first award will be given by Dr. Wade Grow, the Chair of Anatomy, and he will present award on behalf of the Department of Anatomy. Well, thank you, Associate Dean Inouye. Our department teaches gross anatomy, histology, embryology, and neuroscience as a single anatomical sciences curriculum in first year. Today I have the privilege of bestowing the award for outstanding academic performance in anatomical sciences. For the students, there is intrigue trying to guess who will receive each award. <laughs> Let me drop some clues. This student enjoys yoga. Well, that didn't, that didn't, uh, that didn't narrow it down too much. This student received a bachelor's degree in dietetics from Kansas State University and a master's degree in nutrition from Tufts. This student was a licensed dietitian nutritionist in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and worked for Sodexo hospitals in both states. Most importantly, in addition to being one of the top students all three quarters of our anatomical sciences curriculum last year, this student was an enthusiastic TA for anatomy this year. Please join me in congratulating for outstanding academic performance in anatomical sciences, student Dr. Zhang Mu Ge Cynthia Chung. We will now have Dr. Jose Hernandez, the Chair of Biochemistry and Molecular <laughs> Genetics. <laughs> Present the award from his department. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, very exciting to have a chance to see you all in person uh, once more uh, before you uh, depart for rotations, and I want to join everyone in congratulating on all your success to get to this point and wish you the best for your board exams and rotations. And uh, for the families, uh, first, uh, these biochemistry courses that we presented, they uh, presented uh, uh, describe the molecules that we have in our body. So we went through a number of, of topics, talking about communication between cells, formation of a blood clot, inheritance of genes, information about nutrition and a healthy diet, and of course, metabolic pathways. 
or what we do with the food that we eat. So I know students would really like now to talk more about glycolysis and the TSA cycle, but uh, we don't have time for that now. So instead, we will present uh, the biochemistry award to a very accomplished second year, st uh, second year student. And uh, I have to say that you also made it very difficult for us to choose only one person because many of you perform very well uh, in these courses. And as Dr. Groa will give you four hints to see if you can figure out who this student is. So uh, first, this student graduated from uh, graduating from undergrad in 2017 with a Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences. Uh, second, this student graduated with a master's degree in 2021 from, from the California University of Science and Medicine. Uh, third, at Midwestern, this student has served as home education coordinator and also as vice president of academics in the Sigma Sigma Phi fraternity. And fourth and last, uh, what uh, really stood out for us the most was the service work that this student did so in addition to many efforts uh, helping the community and, and in different volunteer groups, this student has spent a large amount of time uh, preparing slides and practice questions and coordinating, coordinating review presentations for first year students. So you probably already guess who this student is, so please join me in congratulating the winner of the Biochemistry Award, the student Dr. Jasmine David. Dr. Leila al Nakash, the chair of the Department of Physiology, will now present the award from the Department of Physiology. Well, that was a surprise. I thought I was up last. <laughs> like, wake up. Honestly, it's so lovely to see you all. It's amazing. Um, what an awesome class. Inspiring, you're all resilient. And I really have to say congratulations to each and every one of you for, for, for all of your collective successes. And I know your, your, um, your boards, you're going to rock them and move on to be uh, stellar in your rotations. So I wish you all the best. It really is an honor to be here on behalf, on behalf of our department to present the award for outstanding accomplishment in physiology. And um, as my colleagues will repeatedly say, it's a real challenge to select just one person from the class. But I would like to share a few notes about the recipient of this award. So prior to entering the DO program, this student completed an undergraduate degree in biology. So we're narrowing it down a bit. <laughs> Served as an emergency medical technician, further narrowing it down and went on to earn an MA from our very own biomedical sciences program here. This student is, has club activities also. So this student is the president of the Heme Oncology, so Hematology Oncology Club on campus and Student American Osteopathic Academy of Orthopedics. Let's try saying that really fast. <laughs> the PI for this student said, because this student also did research last summer, the PI said, this student is so very good in so many ways, except this student supports Arsenal. So if you follow English soccer, you'll know what is wrong with that statement. <laughs> Comments from others about this student included the following, professional, organized, likable, pleasure to work with, hardworking. So I echo those sentiments with my own interactions with this individual. It gives me great pleasure to give this year's award for outstanding accomplishment in physiology to <laughs> student Dr. Quentin Anson. <laughs> Who is not clearly here? The next, the next award will be presented by Dr. Gerald Call, 
Professor of Pharmacology, and he is going to present the award on behalf of the Department of Pharmacology. It really is a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, in this class, and it's been a, definitely a road so far, right? <laughs> um, it's not over yet. Farm is still happening. So, <laughs> so far, I'm the first second year class that's still going on. So keep going, okay? The best is yet to come. All right, so for outstanding uh, accomplishment in pharmacology. Uh, our student um, that we chose came from Prescott, Arizona, so just up the road, right? But they decided to go to Kansas for their education to Baker University in Baldwin City, um, where she was on, yes, I I did use that personal pronoun. She was on the women's basketball team there for the first couple years. But she didn't just focus on sports while she was there. Um, she was on the dean's list all four years and ended up graduating magna sum cum laude. So uh, that was in biology degree as well, biology major, but with dual minors in chemistry and psychology. She was a real go-getter. She spent her last summer performing research here on campus, her last free summer of her life, right? Um, and has been an outstanding student in pharmacology this year. And I'm pleased to present this award uh, to Hannah Madsen. <laughs> who also doesn't seem to be here today, so. We'll give it to her later. Thank you, everyone. The next award will pre be presented by Dr. Catherine Leva, who is the Chair of Microbiology and Immunology, and she will present the award from the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. All right. Welcome. Glad to see everyone here today. And as chair, it is just my honor and great privilege to be able to represent my department and present this award for outstanding excellence in both disciplines of immunology as well as microbiology. So the student doctor chosen to receive this award hails from the western region of the United States. <laughs> Did I narrow it down yet? The student doctor went to high school within the central coast area of California then migrated south, receiving a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and, and cell biology from one of the southern UC schools. Narrowing down yet? Following graduation, this doctor, uh, student um, uh, kept extremely busy before, becoming to, uh, before coming to Midwestern. This, this student was employed as a research associate for a major pharmaceutical company, was a teacher assistant for a molecular cell biology course and served the local community by serving as an EMT. If that wasn't enough, this student also spent time tutoring adolescents enrolled in a charter school that preferentially accepted low-income students that strove to be the first in their families to actually graduate from college. We are fortunate that this student doctor chose ASCOM to pursue the dream of becoming a physician and has excelled academically and professionally since matriculating. So I am extremely pleased to announce that this year's recipient for the outstanding um, academic achievement in both disciplines of microbiology and immunology goes to student Dr. Roxana Dane. Now, Dr. Tony Tulo, Chair of the Department of Pathology, 
will present the award from the Department of Pathology. Thank you so much, you guys. I love you all, too. So uh, <laughs> love goes both ways. So I'm uh, for the families who are here. Uh, my name's Tony Tulo, and I'm the chair of the department. I'm representing the uh, pathology department. Uh, so uh, all of the students know what pathology is, but ask your family. See if they know what pathology is. And the families, please ask your student. You'll get a mouthful, right? So anyways, uh, 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 the student that uh, I would like to give an award to uh, is a very excellent student. All of you here know that it's so you have to put in a lot of work into the class, into pathology. It's work, 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 and more work. So to ex excel in this class, you have to have worked very, very, very hard. So. Uh, uh, the, uh, the student that uh, I would like to give the award to, uh, the, the big clue is she's a double major in uh, biology and dance. And then she danced her way to us, and we're lucky that <laughs> happened. So uh, uh, she hails from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, so she probably got sick of the cold weather up there, wise choice to come to Phoenix. And again, uh, we're lucky that that happened. Uh, so I would like to award uh, the uh, Department of Pathology uh, 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 award to uh, student Dr. Jessica Jacobs. It's hard to tell if these are faculty awards or student awards. <laughs> so I'm here to present the last award, award from the College of Graduate Studies. And this is from the, the Dean's Office. This award it recognizes a student for their academic excellence in all the basic science disciplines. So I'm gonna give you a set of clues, but uh, I think I'm probably starting with a big one first. So this student doctor uh, chosen by the basic science departments, received a bachelor's degree from Gonzaga University in psychology with a pre-medical focus. As an undergraduate student, this student volunteered in a pediatric oncology unit at a medical center and children's hospital, assisting hospital nurses and providing support to parents, caretakers, and easing the loneliness and anxieties of frightened children. After graduation, the student worked as a medical scribe in an emergency department. And, he also, and, they, sorry, and they also worked in the primary care office division of the Oregon Health Authority. There, the student assisted with managing the distribution of a primary care workforce in Oregon to incentivize physicians to practice in rural settings and in, under, and in other underserved areas in need of primary care. In addition to pursuing a doctorate degree in osteopathic medicine with the ASCOM class of 2025, this student is earning a dual degree in the Master of Public Health program. These collective accomplishments are a testament to this student's commitment to compassionate personal and community health care. The basic science chairs unanimously agreed that this year's recipient of the Award for Excellence in the Foundational Biomedical Sciences is student Dr. Michael Consani. Naming the, uh, those who will be presenting the clinical 
Awards is Dr. Reeder, and I'm actually going to give him this, what I like to refer to as the Britney Spears. I'm sorry, Dr. Kemper, but I'm pretty sure we all agree as the Garth Brooks. <laughs> so we, we, we had the, the Basic Science Awards, and on the clinical side for clinical courses, we also have an awards. Uh, to start with the Department of Osteopathic Family and Community Medicine, we have two different awards, and I'll be introducing each um, presenter and team of presenters as we move forward. Presenting the Excellence in Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine, the Vice Chair of the Department, Dr. Lawrence Sands. Hello. Okay. Uh, anyhow, just, again, it's an honor to be here to be able to, you know, welcome, you know, congratulate everybody. I mean, and, you know, I'm sure you're thinking back about what it was like sitting here, the, you know, the first day of orientation, and now you're here on, you know, embarking on your third year of medical school and, and rotations, and i um, just really excited to see what you guys are all going to accomplish in your third year. Many of you have accomplished quite a bit just in these first two years. Um, the, the award I'm going to you know, present today is that, as Dr. Reeder said, is the Excellence in Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine Award. It's given to an academically strong student who has demonstrated interest and proficiency in osteopathic principles and practice. This year's recipient was recommended by the faculty uh, who have worked with them, who comment that the student is knowledgeable about OMM, is an excellent peer mentor and teacher, and is always smiling. I think that always helps in any situation. So, The student was a table trainer uh, in the o OMS-1 osteopathic clinical medicine course in all three quarters, um, helping to teach the osteopathic concepts to the first year cl class and is currently the vice president of the student chapter of the American Academy of Oste Osteopathy here on campus. So if you don't already know, please join me in congratulating Isabella Bucifero. Apparently a popular choice. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sands. For the next award, uh, the Excellence in Osteopathic Preclinical Medicine, we have uh, Drs. Jenna Sankum and, and Dr. Danielle Barnett Trapp. Thank you and congratulations, everybody. This is such an exciting time where hopefully all this we're teaching you in ICM is going to come to fruition as you get out and actually apply it to your patients. For the family and guests, I'm Danielle Barnett Trapp, and this is Dr. Jenna Sankum. And we course direct the Introduction to Clinical Medicine course for the second year medical students, so they're currently in our class. And we're here to give out the, the award for excellence in osteopathic preclinical medicine. <laughs> this is awarded to an osteopathic medical student who has excelled in the preclinical medicine course. The student not only performed well academically, but took initiative to help advance the knowledge of their classmates by providing additional resources to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in patient care. They are also active on campus and currently serve as the Vice President of the Gender and Sexuality Alliance. The Award for Excellence in Osteopathic Preclinical Medicine goes to student Dr. Anne-Marie Aziz. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Barnett Trapp and Dr. Sankum. For the Department of Emergency Medicine, uh, for the Ultrasound Award, Dr. Chip Finch. Thank you, Dr. Reeder. <clears throat> and first and foremost, congratulations to the entire class. Uh, uh, job well done, but you're not quite there just yet, but uh, it'll be here soon. So uh, for families, welcome as well. My name is Dr. Finch. I am an emergency physician uh, by uh, clinical practice and training, and specifically a practicing board certified osteopathic emergency physician. Uh, I've been in practice for quite some time, but had the honor uh, about six years ago from the dean to actually integrate ultrasound into our curriculum. And so six years ago, uh, we started a small group, which has now led into our second class of graduating students uh, this past year who have had a four-year integrated longitudinally uh, and vertically integrated model over the course of four years. So pretty unique. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount of medical schools that have what we have, which is, which is actually pretty... Uh, not only fun, but also an interesting aspect of your education that you'll continue to, to flourish with and practice as you're out there caring for your patients. Uh, I was asked, though, to identify one student, though, uh, who would represent the Ultrasound of the Year Award for, uh, for your class. Uh, you know, it's hard to pick one student. I did reach out to Dr. Alan Akash and to Dr. Simons uh, in basic science, uh, not only for anatomy and physiology, as we have ultrasound integrated in a lot of our different courses over the course of the first two years. And between their help, myself, as well as some of the other academic uh, faculty here and some of our leads, we came up with a criteria of saying, well, who would deserve this award? First of all, someone that really is engaged, has some leadership skills that were already shared by Dr. Nichols earlier today, and has a passion for ultrasound. Not only a passion for ultrasound, but can teach others, uh, their fellow classmates, faculty, preceptors, friends, family, whoever it may be, and has that true interest of sharing that knowledge. In addition to that, this person participated in numerous workshops and events that surrounded ultrasound, not only within the ultrasound interest group as a club member, but also in numerous other club activities that, that involved ultrasound as well. And most importantly, was described by all the faculty that I spoke with as an ultrasound champion. So with that being said, you guys, I didn't do the same uh, opportunity of saying what college, you know what, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we can have that conversation later. But let's recognize this year's award for the Ultrasound of the Year Award, student Dr. Alexis Hayes. Thank you, Dr. Finch. Uh, for the Diversity and Inclusion Award, we would like to welcome back to the stage Dr. Leila Aldakash. Hello again. <laughs> so I am super thrilled to present the ASCOM Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award on behalf of the four ASCOM DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Forces. There are four. There's wellness, curriculum, admissions, and outreach, for which I am co-chair with a student. So I'm, I'm not going to give a broad background about this person. I'm going to cut to the chase pretty quickly. So this student is president for the campus, Latino Medical Student Association, secretary for the Hematology Oncology Club, and a member of the ASCOM DEI Outreach Task Force. This student's demonstrated leadership within LMSA, uh, inviting speakers, partnering with LMSA West to host the regional conference here on campus next month. The student demonstrates passion and dedication to supporting endeavors for equity for everyone. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of my fellow ASCOM DEI Task Force chairs to give this year's ASCOM Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Award to student Dr. Stephanie 
Echeverria. Thank you, Dr. Altakash. To present the ASCOM Dean's Leadership Award, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Kemper. Thank you for giving me back the uh, Britney Spears. <laughs> so, as Dr. Um, Nichols talked a little bit about leadership. Part of leadership is also paying it forward. And so one of the things that, that I do to pay it forward is, is that my husband and I contribute to a scholarship fund that can be used to recognize a student who has been a leader in their class. Um, typically, that leader is going to come from either the Student Government Association or from SOMA. This year, I'd like to award that scholarship, and it was, it was, uh, the person was selected through our scholarship committee. I'd like to award that scholarship, which is a $3,000 scholarship, to student Dr. Albert Wang. Thank you. So believe it or not, you're heading so fast toward graduation that the next two years will go by faster than the first two years did. Um, and Within a few years of that, you potentially could be a program director in a family medicine program here in Phoenix. Um, Dr. Marima Buchai is a 2011 graduate of ASCOM, the program director at Abrazo Central for Family Medicine, and a veteran, Dr. Buchai. Everybody. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, doctor, for outing my age. It's fine. I wasn't going to like mention how long ago I graduated, but that's okay. Uh, good afternoon. It's a really great honor to be here speaking with all of you today. Um, I want to start, since everybody else was volunteering embarrassing stories and Dr. Scott wasn't here to tell mine, that my first rotation was actually with Dr. Scott in the family medicine clinic here. And I remember being so nervous describing a childhood rash that I started pointing to my body to explain where the rash was. And she made me sit on my hands and use my words. <laughs> so um, it was definitely a humbling and learning moment and one that I can completely laugh at today. Um, and it has made me so much better for it. Um, I do promise to not tell too many stories that back in my day, which now you know how long ago, I walked uphill both ways in the snow in Phoenix. Um, but I do want you all to take a moment and just reflect on how much you've accomplished and how far you've come. And take a look at the person next to you, to your right and to your left, and think about your families and your faculty and all of the people that have had a hand in you getting this far and so much closer to your dream, which is, right, working with actual people, treating them, being not just a part of a clinical team, but being an integral part of that team in the decision-making, in owning that patient responsibility and suggesting what plans you have and how to help them and learning their dog's names um, some of those stories will stay with you forever. Um, and soon enough, you're going to be applying to residency too. 
So I always tell everybody, please just find your people. Find your joy. Medicine is something that is so special and it's so unique. And nobody should do it for the money that you can make, right? Because we are all really smart and could have done anything else and probably made more money earlier in life, right? So <laughs> find your people, find your family, see where you fit in, and live your dream. Um, my journey here started many years ago, as Dr. Kemper told everybody. <laughs> uh, but every step of the way, my rotations, my residency, even my career after the military, I have had a touch point with an alumni of this program, whether it was on a rotation with another Midwestern student. In my residency class, I ended up with a classmate. I rotated through all the HPSP students. As Dr. Kemper said, I was in the military, so tons of Midwestern students in Las Vegas, um, also in California. Uh, and there was never a time that I didn't reach out to somebody on this campus that they didn't reach back. So the importance of keeping in touch, not just with your colleagues, but with your mentors, with your teachers, with your friends, is going to pay back dividends forever. This is your family, and when I came back from the military and deployed and came back, the first conference I went to, I saw the entire group of people that hooded me on the stage. And it was such a amazing homecoming. And now I work for Midwestern, so it was a very amazing, like, full round moment. And you never know, there's tons of us. There's 250 of you in your class, right? So there are tons of us in the valley and throughout the nation. You will be rotating with us in clinics. You will be seeing other students. Please remember to reach out. Midwestern has been my home base, the place where I was always invested, and it's invested in me. The one thing I will say is that it, it has always been obvious to me that this university always wanted to accept well-rounded students that truly cared about their patients and their communities. It is a place that is above all else focused on student success. It is a place that is dedicated to academic excellence, professionalism, leadership, and community service. I remember being impressed as a student and still continue to be by how this university and its many staff, students, and teachers value and live the mission and the vision of this school. So remember when you go out there, you're not just representing yourself, but your profession and your school. Remember that there are many ASCOM graduates throughout the Valley and that everyone that teaches wants you to succeed. So be excited, grab as much knowledge and experience as you can. And as Dr. Reeder talked about, the learning, the growing happens in discomfort. If you do not push yourself, you will get out of it only what you put in. Please remember that even being told to sit on your hands will make you a better physician than you ever imagined. And more than anything, remember that though the days may be long, the years will fly by. So enjoy the ride. This is what you've been working for your entire life. And remember to stay connected to your colleagues, to your mentors, and your college. Our world is much smaller than you think, and you will continue to run into all of these amazing people, and you're going to pick up right where you left off. Congratulations. So if I can get this going, and I may need help from Dr. Nidham so you can at least see him for a moment. <laughs> he spent a lot of time recording the names. Actually, Dr. Nidham's many Student years... Student Dr. Of, Brittany Adams. There we go. 
student Dr. Elliot Adland. Student Dr. Faraz Alias. Student Dr. Marion Alam. Student Dr. Bradford Albrecht. Student Dr. Rosa Ali. Student Dr. Kush Amin. Student Dr. Hannah Andres. Student Dr. Emily Angelis Mancinas. Student Dr. Quinton Anson. <laughs> Student Dr. Cindy Anton. Student Dr. Alexander Aratani. Student Dr. Jeffrey Arrington. Student Dr. George Ashu. Student Dr. Umrath Utiam. Student Dr. Anne Marie Aziz. Student Dr. Sapan Azmi. Student Dr. Victoria Babkiss. Student Dr. Luis Badang. Student Dr. Justin Baines. Student Dr. Rachel Beam. Student Dr. Paris Beauregard. <laughs> Student Dr. Michael Bembenek. Student Dr. Hannah Berry. Student Dr. Pega Biparva. Student Dr. Chody Black. <laughs> Student Dr. Tiffany Blackledge. <laughs> Student Dr. Samantha Blanchard. <laughs> Student Dr. Garrett Blatter. <laughs> Student Dr. Jacob Borla. <laughs> Student Dr. Caleb Bowers. Student Dr. Daniel Bose. Student Dr. Anhad Brar. Student Dr. Isabella Huchaferro. <laughs> Student Dr. Stefan Barastin. Student Dr. Rajesh Bhuta. <laughs> Student Dr. Serene Carroll. Student Dr. James Cardi. <laughs> Student Dr. Jake Castaldo. Student Dr. Isabella Calkins. <laughs> Student Dr. Mary Chowdhury. Student Dr. Yamini Shavan. Student Dr. Cody Chen. Student Dr. Zhang Mo Gu Sheng. Student Dr. Michael Christensen. Student Dr. Umema Chadwala. Student Dr. Samantha Chung. Student Dr. Michael Kasani. Student Dr. Lady Renee Consolacion. <laughs> Student Dr. Lincoln Conway. Student Dr. Natalie Crisson. <laughs> Student Dr. Hermione Degain. <laughs> Student Dr. Alexandra Dane. Student Dr. Jasmine David. <laughs> Student Dr. Cassandra Decker. <laughs> Student Dr. Hemet Dillon. <laughs> Student Dr. Lucas Doe. <laughs> Student Dr. Jacqueline Doan. <laughs> Student Dr. Brendan Doyle. 
student Dr. Kimberly Drinkwater. Student Dr. Stephanie Echevarria. Student Dr. Savannah Edenhofer. Student Dr. Anthony Ennis. Student Dr. Danielle Fulke. Student Dr. Sydney Fees. Student Dr. Serena Fernandez. Student Dr. Ryan Fesser. Student Dr. William Flake. Student Dr. Stephen Flinders. Student Dr. Peter Flores Martin. Student Dr. Taylor Forbeck. Student Dr. Jason Gallo. Student Dr. Peter Gallos. Student Dr. Raha Gadamzan. Student Dr. Cyrus Gafari. Student Dr. Skylar Gibbons Stovall. Student Dr. Sandeep Gill. Student Dr. Simran Gill. Student Dr. Daniel Gerges. Student Dr. Timothy Glass. Student Dr. Ishan Godra. Student Dr. Grant Gordon. Student Dr. Brian Graham. Student Dr. Justin Griffin. Student Dr. Benjamin Griffin Medellin. Student Dr. Rachel Gross. Student Dr. Ratika Gupta. Student Dr. Alexander Gust. Student Dr. Robert Hare. Student Dr. Momayant Han. Student Dr. Lamaya Hawk. Student Dr. Riley Hayes. Student Dr. Alexis Hayes. Student Dr. Kyle Hendricks. Student Dr. Lauren Henry. Student Dr. Adam Hepworth. Student Dr. Cody Hill. Student Dr. William Hoffman. Student Dr. Aspen Holden. Student Dr. Jonathan Rovat. Student Dr. Tanya Sean. Student Dr. Celine Hu. Student Dr. Ashley Hewlett. Student Dr. Gloria Wynn. Student Dr. Bryant M. Student Dr. Jessica Jacobs. Student Dr. Henry Jian. Student Dr. Niha Zhao. Student Dr. Lubna Kabir. Student Dr. Shanithi Kule. Student Dr. Jordan Kaminga. Student Dr. Jimin Kang. Student Dr. Samin Kargari. Student Dr. Sayede Nazanin Kerman Shahi. 
Student Dr. Mohammed Khalid. <laughs> Student Dr. Sidra Khan. <laughs> Student Dr. Pankuri Karbanda. <laughs> Student Dr. Kenneth Kilber. <laughs> Student Dr. Suyun Kim. <laughs> Student Dr. Eugene Kim. Student Dr. Michael Kinoe. <laughs> Student Dr. Thomas Klepper. <laughs> Student Dr. Ryan Knowlton. <laughs> Student Dr. Jenna Kane. <laughs> Student Dr. Evelyn Q. Student Dr. Kimberly Law. <laughs> Student Dr. Hubert Lamb. <laughs> Student Dr. Jacob Larson. <laughs> Student Dr. Duke Lay. <laughs> Student Dr. Cole Liker. <laughs> Student Dr. Elisa Lieberman. Student Dr. Christopher Lynn. Student Dr. Christopher Lynn. <laughs> Student Dr. Ivy Liu. Student Dr. Daniel Lomas. <laughs> Student Dr. Jaron Lois. Student Dr. Haley Lynch. Student Dr. Daniel McKessie. <laughs> Student Dr. Hannah Madsen. <laughs> Student Dr. Haroom Maktoum. <laughs> Student Dr. Rohit Malati. <laughs> Student Dr. Megan Manson. <laughs> Student Dr. Pravaja Morella. Student Dr. Kevin Martz. <laughs> Student Dr. Abdul Masri. <laughs> Student Dr. Samantha Mata. <laughs> Student Dr. Marquise Mayberry. <laughs> Student Dr. Nicole McCormick. <laughs> Student Dr. Nina McFaig. Student Dr. Andrea Meyer. <laughs> Student Dr. Ashlyn Myers. <laughs> Student Dr. Alexandria Miller. <laughs> Student Dr. Benjamin Mills. <laughs> Student Dr. Haley Mitchell. <laughs> Student Dr. Miriam Morcos. Student Dr. Jade Morse. Student Dr. Rebecca Munger. <laughs> Student Dr. Taha Muhammad. <laughs> Student Dr. Manur Mukuram. <laughs> Student Dr. Skylar Murphy. <laughs> Student Dr. Jeffrey Mutterpearl. Student Dr. Ungud Nandra. Student Dr. Arjun Nandi. Student Dr. Calvin Nielsen. Student Dr. Diana Wynn. Student Dr. Lawrence Wynn. Student Dr. Richard Wynn. Student Dr. Richard Wynn. <laughs> Student Dr. Neam Narani. <laughs> Student Dr. Lauren Noodleman. <laughs> Student Dr. John Omer.
student Dr. Priscilla Oliva. <laughs> student Dr. Angel Olivares. <laughs> student Dr. Shelby Olson. <laughs> student Dr. Thalia Olson. <laughs> student Dr. Tyler Arose. Student Dr. Savan Laksma. Student Dr. Emma Parent. Student Dr. Chance Parker. Student Dr. Nikki Patel. Student Dr. Narali Patel. Student Dr. Shafali Patel. Student Dr. Vishal Patel. Student Dr. Khalil Patan. Student Dr. Taylor Patton. Student Dr. Sarah Poloquin. Student Dr. Sarah Petrides. Student Dr. Christine Pham. Student Dr. Cole Porter. Student Dr. Theodore Rader. Student Dr. Rathika Rao. Student Dr. Sahil Raul. Student Dr. Trevor Reed. Student Dr. Joshua Reese. Student Dr. Tanner Risk. Student Dr. Alec Robitaille. Student Dr. Braden Resch. Student Dr. Cassandra Rogers. Student Dr. Emily Rominger. <laughs> Student Dr. Robert Rosenblatt. <laughs> Student Dr. Andrew Rosabone. <laughs> Student Dr. Elias Rubin. <laughs> Student Dr. Melissa Rubin. <laughs> Student Dr. Greer Russell. Student Dr. Ian Russell. <laughs> Student Dr. Ashley Samuelson. <laughs> Student Dr. Leslie Santiago Gesteiger. <laughs> Student Dr. Rylan Savage. <laughs> Student Dr. Anna Shearing. <laughs> Student Dr. Tyler Seeley. Student Dr. Arman Sakan. <laughs> Student Dr. Sarah Shake. <laughs> Student Dr. Nikhil Sharma. <laughs> Student Dr. Talha Shake. <laughs> Student Dr. Nicholas Shine. <laughs> Student Dr. Troy Shipman. Student Dr. Edwin Shoemaker. <laughs> Student Dr. Avneet Singh. <laughs> Student Dr. Eliza Skimp. <laughs> Student Dr. Chad Solomon. <laughs> Student Dr. Seth Stapley. <laughs> Student Dr. Samuel Steinocker. Student Dr. Andra Stovall. <laughs> Student Dr. Bobby Stowali. <laughs> Student Dr. Faye Sue. <laughs> Student Dr. Parker Swarsa. <laughs> Student Dr. Samia Surti Muhammad. <laughs> Student Dr. Julie Tamayo. 
student Dr. Christine Tang. Student Dr. Benjamin Totter. Student Dr. Brandon Taylor. Student Dr. Abdullah Termizi. Student Dr. Christopher Tarosian. Student Dr. Shahada Trish. Student Dr. Wei Trong. Student Dr. Madison Yuli. Student Dr. Natasha Vanya. Student Dr. Sonia Villapuente. Student Dr. Sapna Verdi. Student Dr. Albert Wang. Student Dr. Eric Wang. Student Dr. Nicholas Whitbeck. Student Dr. Marcelina Weirtek. Student Dr. Lawrence Wilkerson. Student Dr. Jaron Wilson. Student Dr. Laurel Witt. Student Dr. Zufun Waldemariam. Student Dr. Ethan Wright. Student Dr. Tianwan Zhu. Student Dr. Alice Yaldiko. Student Dr. Jared Yancey. Student Dr. Alice Yen. Student Dr. Ian Zhang. So this is a beautiful class. And um, especially the, the photographs with the white coats. So thank you, those of you who sent those in. Um, on the bottom of your, of your program, hopefully most of you have a program, there is the osteopathic oath, which I'm going to read from a giant print version. <laughs> and if all of the, the students could stand, and then we will read this oath together. So read along with me. I do hereby affirm my loyalty to the profession I am about to enter. I will be mindful always of my great responsibility to preserve the health and the life of my patients, to retain their confidence and respect, both as a physician and a friend, who will guard their secrets with scrupulous honor and fidelity, to perform faithfully my professional duties, to employ only those recognized methods of treatment consistent with good judgment and with my skill and ability, keeping in mind always nature's laws and the body's inherent capacity for recovery. I will be ever vigilant in aiding in the general welfare of the community, sustaining its laws and institutions, and not engaging in those practices which will in any way bring shame or discredit upon myself or my profession. I will give no drugs for deadly purposes to any person though it be asked of me. I will endeavor to work in accord with my colleagues in a spirit of progressive cooperation and never by word or by act cast imputations upon them or their rightful practices. I will look with respect and esteem upon all those who have taught me my art. To my college, I will be loyal and strive always for its best interests and for the interests of the students who will come after me. I will be ever alerted to further the application of basic biologic truths to the healing arts and to develop the principles of osteopathy, which were first enunciated by Andrew Taylor Still. 
Thank you. May be seated. So that brings us to the end of our program. And I want to thank everyone for participating, for the families who've come out. And what we're going to do is we are going to have people ready. It looks like we're going to only go this way. Um, to give you your books. And if you have your ID badge, go ahead and pull it out. So what we're going to do is start with this row two all the way across. And if you can make your way over to... Oh, do we have somebody at this table? Okay. This row two goes that way, and this row two goes that way. So if you could go ahead and stand and head that way. And families, thank you for coming. If you want to step back, that's fine. Um, we're just going to try to get the students through in a, a quick, an easy manner. And uh, Dr. Nichols will be...